Thank you everyone for joining us today. At this time, I'd like to open it up to our panelists to start the program. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Rebecca Piller and I'm the vice chair of ADL's Committee on Law Enforcement, Extremism and Anti-Semitism, also known as the COLIA Committee. A couple of housekeeping notes. All of your cameras and microphones have been turned off for this webinar. If you want to ask a question, please type it into the Q&A section of your Zoom screen and we'll try to get your question after the presentation. And please keep in mind that this webinar is being recorded. A couple of months ago, our former committee chair, Don Mayerson, alerted us to frightening aspects of the Christian nationalism movement, especially as it related to candidates running for office. And I'd like to make a very important note. By Christian nationalism, we do not mean mainstream Christianity or all of Christianity. Our presenter, Marilyn Mayo, will clarify that during her presentation. But before we go to Marilyn, I'd like to ask Don to give us a brief background report on what prompted him to send up an alarm and what prompted us to provide you with this webinar. Don? Thank you, Rebecca. Good afternoon, everyone. The very first sentence to the First Amendment to our Constitution states, Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Now, I want you to pause for a moment and think about what our country would be like if a political group that did not believe in one of our pillars of democracy, separation of church and state, were to take over the government of our country. This is one of the goals of Christian nationalism, that the laws of this country should be dictated by Christians, primarily men, and that there should be no separation of church and state. Another goal I learned is their belief that only white conservative Christians are true Americans. These beliefs arise from a version of American history dating back approximately three centuries, one that wrongly holds that the United States was supposed to be explicitly a Christian country founded by and for Christian people, and its laws should be determined by theology. Our founding fathers were very clear about that. Their intention was exactly the opposite. However, removing the barrier between church and state is central to the success of those who are Christian nationalists. I also learned that we are not the only ones that have concern about Christian nationalism and its propensity for violence. In a letter dated June 2nd, but just recently released by a group of prominent Christian leaders, including heads of major denominations they urged members of the January 6th Select Committee to investigate Christian nationalism. They argued it played a critical role in the insurrection. The June 2nd letter read in part, the ideology of Christian nationalism helped motivate and intensify the insurrection. We asked the committee to thoroughly investigate the role that Christian nationalism played in the attack. After researching Christian nationalism, Red lights started flashing brightly. I knew that we at ADL had to educate others on the dangers to our country and community from this group. I want to thank ADL Regional Director Mark Tobin and senior staff members Dina Marks and Margie Levin, who have done a terrific job of immediately getting to work organizing and promoting this webinar. I'm going to send it back now to Rebecca, who will introduce our expert, Marilyn Mayo, from the ADL Center on Extremism. Rebecca. Thank you, Don. Now we turn to Marilyn Mayo for more. Marilyn Mayo is a senior research fellow at ADL's Center on Extremism. She has been with the ADL for 25 years, having previously served as the Associate Director of Investigative Research. Marilyn is an expert on right-wing extremists in the United States and in Europe, ranging from white supremacists to academic racists to anti-immigrant groups. She often speaks to the media and law enforcement about the activities of hate groups and movements across the country. She has worked on numerous reports for ADL and writes regularly for the organization's blog. Marilyn received her BA from Barnard College in New York and her MA from the City University of New York Graduate Center. As you listen to Marilyn's report, if you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A section of your Zoom screen. 
Marilyn. Thank you so much, Rebecca. Um, I'm so happy to have the opportunity to talk to you today about this uh, really rather complicated topic. And I want to um, say from the very beginning that I am not um, an expert on religion. I am not an expert on, uh, on Christianity by any means. But the one thing that, um, that I am an expert on is extremism. So I want to, uh, with this webinar, really put into context what we're seeing in terms of um, you know, Christian nationalism and what it means and how it's being used. And that's, that's really what I'm going to focus on um, you know, in, in this, uh, you know, in my presentation. So, um, hold on one second. Um, I'm having, uh, here we go. So, um, one of the things that, uh, is really important to say from the very beginning is that different people define Christian nationalism as different things. And I, and I say that it's important because the term, which has come into great use in the last year, um, is, is depending on who's talking, they'll present it in different ways. So I, I um, have two quotes here from two different people that is more of a way um, of how I think about Christian nationalism. Um, in terms of, um, you know, how we view it, you know, uh, at ADL, but also um, there's something else about this, which is to say that Christian nationalism in many ways is another term for the religious right or the Christian right. But again, different people have interpreted it in, in somewhat different ways. So this first sentence about Christian nationalism is grounded and believes that the United States was founded by and for Christians, that being a Christian nation is central to national identity and that it's the job of activists and government officials to keep it that way. That's from uh, someone named Peter Montgomery, who's a researcher with Right Wing Watch and he, he writes um, on uh, issues like Christian nationalism. Uh, the second one, and I see that the um, one of the letters uh, is in a different color, I, I apologize for that, but it says it's a way of thinking about the identity of the country as being a fundamentally Christian nation and that exists on earth by some divine providence and to achieve a certain purpose on earth as intended to be governed according to that purpose. That's from Charles Homans, who's a writer with the New York Times and does a podcast. Um, to me, this is these two different ways of talking about Christian nationalism is sort of a general way of um, how most people approach that that term and, and in terms of what it means. Um, it's really important to talk about how Christian nationalism has come to um, be defined in this country and, and come to um, be talked about so much. And it's really important, again, to talk about the apostolic movement. Again, not an expert on, on this religion, but we do know that the apostolic movement um, is growing in this country and it's, it, it traps all different kinds of people, not just white Christians, but people from different backgrounds. It its herons believe that the world needs to, uh, as they say, be conquered by militant action, which could be both spiritual and non-spiritual to establish this godly government, um, you know, for the purpose of, uh, you know, establishing uh, Christ. Uh, this is how they, they present it. Um, on earth. And then they frequently refer to things such as spiritual warfare, um, believe that they believe that satanic forces are working against them um, and that they need to, of course, respond to that. And then what's really important is the apostolic movement talks about um, seven mountains. And the seven mountains is what they believe, the, the areas that they believe that Christians need to be involved in. That is the arts, business, education, family, government, media, and religion. That covers a wide swath, obviously. And, um, but this is, um, again, a growing movement that sees Christianity as central to all these aspects of life um, in, you know, in this country. Now, one of the things that's driving some of the more extreme reactions within Christian nationalism 
are the different um, social, political, and cultural changes that we've seen over the last few decades. Um, so you have a number of people who, um, again, uh, consider themselves, um, you know, Christian or religious right or Christian nationalist, whatever term they may use. They want to talk. They talk about recreating the real America. And what is the real America to them? It's a vision of America that goes back to. Um, a focus on traditional roles for men and women, a focus on, on religion, on going to church, um, and this idea that there was this, you know, that in previous times we had this, um, you know, a, a country where, where religion was central to American life, and that is certainly less so if you look at any studies these days, um, that is not, you know, it's not the same either for you know, Christians or Jews, um, or and maybe other religions as well. But we also know that um, a number of these folks who want just a Christian nation don't see other religions such as Judaism and Islam as being of equal importance. Uh, what I think is really um, truly, you know, alarming is the attacks against non-traditional communities, particularly the LGBTQ community and particularly the transgender community. Um, we've seen um, a lot of there, there are you know obviously verbal attacks, but we've seen extremist groups veiled in again talking about um, their their beliefs or and, and and using Christianity in some to some degree to uh, speak out against um, you know the transgender community, but also going to things like uh, drag queen story hours at libraries and threatening. Um, you know, the people who are doing these uh, programs for kids that are supposed to be fun and informative. Um, and it's become something that we've seen a lot of. You're seeing people going to school boards and uh, trying to ban uh, books in libraries. This all comes out of the same thing about the fear of the politi political and cultural and social changes being seen. The other side of this is that the left and liberals are called you know, socialists and communists, kind of the, the worst that you can be. And uh, they're looked at as an evil force to be defeated. And this comes into play a lot in some of the other things I'll be talking about. So um, I need to certainly mention the impact of the 2020 election because um, that election brought together a lot of different forces on the right in this country, including the religious right. And I want to, in particular, mention um, one of now. You know, after the election, which um, you know former President Trump uh, lost, um, there were a number of um, rallies and protests uh, saying that the election was stolen. These are called the Stop the Steal rallies. But one in particular really got our attention. Many, most of them did, I should admit. But there was something called the Jericho March, which took place on December 12th, 2020 in DC. And at that march, which was very religious. So that opening slide I had of the man with the wooden cross, that is from the Jericho March in DC. Um, and speakers called for the walls of corruption and election fraud to fall down. And they likened the protests who came to the Stop the Steal events to biblical soldiers and priests breaching the walls of Jericho and the Battle of Jericho, which is talked about in the Bible. But, um, and again, painted what was going on in the country at that time with the election as, 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 as an actual battle of you know, good and evil, which they were the biblical soldiers that had to step in and do something about it. Speakers at the um, Jericho March included conspiracy theorists like Alex Jones. Some of you may be familiar with him. He's the person who he, he once runs a program called Infowars. He said that the Sandy Hook uh, massacre of, of these young uh, students and teachers was made up. It was a false flag. He says many things are false flags. Um, there were white supremacists who spoke um, like Nick Fuentes. I'll be talking about him and anti-government extremists who were also, there were Oath Keepers at that much. It really was a wide variety of people on the very, on the far right. And um, it's important to talk about that because we also need to then talk about January 6th. You just heard, you heard Don talk about this letter and about Christian nationalism 
uh, the letter to the January 6th committee. The January 6th insurrection um, was obviously a very important moment in our country, an alarming moment when you know people who um, again thought that um, that uh, Biden had not won the election, that they had to intervene on behalf of uh, President Trump to uh, stop um, the uh, election from being certified, breach the Capitol. You all know this story, but in, you know many of the, the people who were involved in this breach had been at the Stop the Steal marches. Many had been at the Jericho march. There was a religious element that was involved in this insurrection. But I also am talking about it so I can talk about what happened after January 6th, which is equally important. So after January 6th, um, you know, some people thought, well, these, you know, maybe after the insurrection and the violence that we saw, that there would be um, a, a pause in um, these, you know, in this idea that uh, these conspiracies, look at, look at the impact they had, but that is not what happened at all. And one of the things that we saw was that many, many um, different people who were involved in promoting this idea of election fraud started to have these conferences. There were all different kinds of conferences around the country where they would bring together uh, different strands of, of the right. Um, but there was one group in particular that really caught our attention. Um, it was a group called Reawaken America. And this is um, a tour that's gone all around the country, literally just everywhere around the country. And it's run by a man named Clay Clark who calls himself a Christian entrepreneur. He does webinars on business. So he doesn't just focus on, on these particular uh, gatherings. But what's important about the gatherings is that these gatherings attract hundreds and hundreds of people. They're meant to appeal to um, pastors and churchgoers. So they're often held at large churches around the country. Um, and you know the pastor of the church is often invited to speak. So, um, and again, they focus on election fraud, but also you know COVID. Um, COVID is still talked about, COVID conspiracies. QAnon, and I'm gonna talk about QAnon in the next slide and explain a little more about it, is talked about. And um, it, it brings together all these, um, uh, you know, the, like the, the pastors, um, elect, uh, conspiracy theorists, and it also brought together a lot of political candidates or pundits who were all basically promoting this idea that you cannot trust the government that there was a war going on. And the latest gatherings, the ones that are happening right before the midterms, focus on something called the Great Reset, which is a warning that global elites are using the pandemic to advance their interests and push forward a globalist plot to destroy American sovereignty and prosperity. And some of the adherents um, who are you know, believers in the Great Reset promote anti-Semitism as part of this conspiracy theory and, and say that you know the ultimate goal of the Great Reset is a global totalitarian regime. And when you have people talking about globalists taking over the world, you can bet that anti-Semitism becomes a part of it. And we have seen that. Um, and um, so this cadre, and now I, I would say that um, in, in the Great um, Awakening tour, there, there's not as much of a focus on Jews like blatantly, but these ideas are percolating under the surface. Um, I need to mention QAnon specifically because it is, and, and I explain what it is. It's, uh, you know, I'm sure many of you already know this, but it's a conspiracy theory, conspiracy theory that basically alleges that um, former President Trump is waging a secret war against the deep state and that the, you know he's alleging a war against these alleged pedophiles who control the world and want run a global child sex trafficking ring. Who are the pedophiles? Well, it's everyone that QAnon thinks is an enemy. It's Democrats. It's like the you know Hollywood um, folks, and and then it's it's the technocrats like Bill Gates are allegedly all part of this ring. And there's a 
piece of QAnon that basically says that children are being kidnapped um, um, you know, for this sex trafficking ring, but that their blood is being drained and used by these pedophiles to uh, prolong their life. And it's crazy stuff, but there are many people who believe this. And um, obviously there's a, you know, an allusion here to the blood libel that we know has been a part of, um, you know, anti-Semitic um, stories ever since medieval times. So um, again, we've seen, and I think one of the biggest changes from the early days of QAnon to now is that there's a lot more anti-Semitism that we're seeing openly promoted by QAnon adherents. But they also use Christian uh, symbols and ideas to, to, again, talk about this battle that they're in between good and evil and they need to save the world and particularly save America. So um, again, um, Christian nationalism, as it's being used, you know, again, I like I said, it's used in different ways by different people, but this belief in America as a Christian nation appeals to a really wide variety of individuals and groups on the far right. And what we're seeing is that American nationalism, which is, again, um, maybe defined in different ways, but I'm going to define it as a lot of the folks who talk about America as a, one, as a unique nation, um, but also as a nation that um, should be like America first. You know, you have that whole grouping that thinks that um, America should put its, um, you know, should not like, should be more isolationist, should focus on, um, you know, promoting American um, values, however people define that. And, um, but a lot of times that American nationalism, you know, this idea of, you know, this, this idea about, people being patriots for America, or fighting for the good of the country, it gets mixed in with Christian nationalism and is pro promoted as one and the same. But I need to be clear, as Rebecca said, that not everyone who promotes this idea or, you know, the, or, or desires, I should say, a Christian nation is an extremist. And I, I would not say that. But these are ideas that are percolating on a regular basis on the right and on the far right. Um, and I want to talk about some of the political figures that have been promoting themselves actually as Christian nationalists and using that term. And one of them is Doug Mastriano, who's pictured here. He lost his bid to be governor of Pennsylvania. Some of you may have been following that race. You may uh, have heard that he was um, attacking his opponent, who was Jewish, um, who is Jewish, I should say, Josh Shapiro. Um, attacking him for going to a Jewish school, saying he was an elitist, um, making veiled, you know, anti-Semitic comments, maybe not so veiled. But again, he was part of this grouping that talked about like the real, you know, what they call the real America, again, white Christian nation. Um, and, um, you know, once again, seeing the left liberals, Democrats as evil forces to be defeated and bringing that into their ideology, their campaigns, et cetera. And I'm going to give you uh, some examples of some other things that were said. Um, so um, basically, uh, I think many of you are familiar with these two figures. Marjorie Taylor Greene ran for Congress in Georgia and won. And Lauren Boebert, um, she is running for Congress in Colorado and had a surprisingly close race. It has She has not been declared the winner yet, although she is in the lead. And 99% of the uh, votes have been counted. So it's like by a couple of thousand votes, really, that um, the election has not been decided yet. But Matt, Marjorie Taylor Greene said, I'm being attacked by the godless left because I'm a proud Christian nationalist. They hate America, they hate God, and they hate us. Again, basically saying that anyone who doesn't agree with her, anyone who has a political difference is an enemy and hates the country. And this is something that a common theme that we see with people who declare themselves Christian nationalists. And then Lauren Boebert said, the church is supposed to direct the government. The government is not supposed to direct the church. Well, as Don said, we have something in this country called separation of church and state, a very, very important part of American um, you know, political um, you know, life uh, is the separation of church and state and very important for all of us and particularly for the Jewish community um, 
as a minority religion in the country. Um, one second, I'm having, there we go. Um, but I wanted to also point to some people who are much more violent in their rhetoric. Ali Alexander that you see on the left here is someone who's a provocateur on the far right. He is a person who was involved in, he was in fact one of the leaders of the Stop the Steal rallies all over the country. He worked, um, you know, actually with white supremacists, although he's from, you know, a different background. Um, and he, he has very much um, been involved on social media, promoting all kinds of, um, you know, very uh, ex extreme ideas. And this is something that he said just a month ago. We will not live in a future where violence doesn't meet widespread, meet widespread perversion. He says that, you know, I'm aligned with a God that will not march quietly into the future where you got all kinds of things hanging out of public eateries restaurants, libraries, with or without children. He's talking about the drag queen story hours and the gay community being able to have events. Um, and then he's he says, I'm, I'm going to be joined by tens of millions. I'm going to teach people what's the more allowable line. And then the next line is what's most alarming. And if they don't deal with the middle, and by that he means, uh, you know, people who um, are, he sees like actually, um, you know, religious right as sort of like middle. I, I actually don't know exactly how he meant the middle, but my my interpretation is that he thinks that some people um, who promote, um, you know, Christian nationalism are, are really in the middle, but he says that they should meet a violent Christian crusade. So if they don't believe in us, they should meet a violent Christian crusade. We all know what happened during the crusade, which is that, you know, thousands of people were killed who didn't share the beliefs of people at that time who were promoting a certain kind of Christianity. Um, now, I also want to be clear that some people who um, promote cr themselves as Christian nationalists are also um, white nationalists. And we know, like, you know, this is not something new. Many white supremacist groups have co-opted co Christian symbols as part of their beliefs. And the picture that I have is an old group that when I first came to the ADL 25 years ago was quite active, Aryan Nations, which was led by the man in the middle, Richard Butler. They promoted something called Christian identity. And Christian identity was basically, basically said that it was white Aryans who were the chosen people and that all other people, Jews and people of color were mud people, not even recognized by God. And you can see in their symbol there on the left that they used a cross integrated into their Aryan nation symbol. But we have a whole new breed of white supremacists who don't make Nazi salutes at all, but present themselves as Christian conservatives, but still promote a virulent kind of anti-Semitism. And by that, I'm talking about people like this person right here, Nick Fuentes on the left. Now, Nick Fuentes, is someone who um, basically it was he was at he, he was at the Unite the Right rally in August 2017. You might all remember that rally. I mean, it was a seminal event in the white supremacist movement. That's where young men uh, marched around the University of Virginia campus, shouting "Jews will not replace us." It brought together white supremacists from every different kind of group: the Klan, neo Nazis. And groups like, you know, people like Nick Fuentes, who went on to form a group called the Groypers. The Groypers is a loose network of young men. It's all men, um, young white men who um, are basically present themselves as Christian conservatives. But when you look into their ideology, it's very much white supremacist. It's very anti-Semitic. Um, and these were folks who were Try, or who are trying to infiltrate the conservative movement in the United States. So for example, um, when uh, the, the, the CPAC, the um, Conservative Political Action Conference has its annual uh, gathering in DC in February, Nick Fuentes has his own gathering called the America First uh, PAC Political Action Conference. And he invites some of the very same people who go to CPAC 
Um, and we know that in the last two years, a number of elected officials have either gone in person, like Paul Gosar in Arizona, Marjorie Taylor Greene, who I just spoke about, and um, Wendy Rogers in Arizona and others. <clears throat> They have gone to his conference and spoken. And when confronted with the fact that he is a white supremacist, they say, no, 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 no. He's, he's, a, he's a Christian conservative. And not only is he a Christian conservative, but he's like this new breed of activist Christian conservative. They're really out there trying to make change. The picture on the right is a group of Groypers wearing America First hats in New York at an anti-abortion march. So they really have gone to a lot of events that they can exploit and join in and, um, but they're being touted by elected officials as sort of like these great new activists. And I think it's certainly of tremendous uh, concern. And then you have someone like Andrew Torba. Andrew Torba is the founder of Gab. Um, Gab is a, a, a social media site that many people who, who have been thrown off Twitter for espousing hate have gone to Gab. So Gab is filled with a lot of extremists, but not, you know, it's not just you know, white supremacists, you know, but a, a number of far right elected officials are on Gab and other figures, you know, other pundits are on Gab. So, you know, Torba has been very openly anti-Semitic. He has said that his ultimate goal is to build a coalition of Christian nationalists and we're gonna take this country back to the glory of God. He also said, and this is just from a few months ago, we don't want people who are atheists. We don't want people who are Jewish. We don't want people who are, who are non-believers. This is an explicitly Christian movement because this is an explicitly Christian country. Okay, so, but Torba, um, I can assure you, is very explicitly anti-Semitic. And something I should have said earlier is that many of the people on the religious right or who call themselves Christian nationalists often talk about Judeo-Christian values. And in that sense, it seems that they are including the Jewish community by using the word Judeo. But um, what they're really, you know, when you, um, and again, I'm, again, I'm not saying that every Christian um, is anti-Semitic or <clears throat> against, um, you know, or wants, <coughs> excuse me, sorry about that. Um, wants you know to get rid of anyone who's not Christian, but often it's just like um, to talk about Judeo-Christian values is to say that they accept what they call the Jewish Bible, but it's still this idea that um, you know the Jews should convert to Christianity and just become Christian. So again, it's it you know even though that word is used, it does not necessarily mean that it's inclusive. Um, so I want to just sort of again, wrap up with some points, um, make a few points, which is that Christian nationalism has become a term to describe a wide range of people on the religious right. And it includes a few different types of people. And I'm just gonna go over this just, just to be clear about it. It includes people who want a Christian nation, but are not necessarily extremists. It includes political figures and pundits who use the term Christian nationalism to promote a certain vision of a traditionalist America with traditional roles for men and women um, and um, is against progressive social changes and in particular the LGBTQ community and in particular the transgender community. And it also includes white supremacists and anti-Semites who, um, are exploiting, I would say, really exploiting the idea of Christian nationalism to promote anti-Jewish views and also to attract followers in doing that. The last slide uh, that I have is, I mean, these are things you, you all already know. What is the impact on, I, I, I'm saying non-Christian communities, not just the Jewish community, because you know it, it goes beyond the Jewish community. You know, Jewish, Muslim, and other communities can be made to feel unwelcome and treated as outsiders. Um, it can, we know already that this can contribute to anti-Semitism and other bigotry. And what's a tremendous concern is that people who promote these beliefs who are in government can create laws and policies that can interfere with the ability of non-Christians to worship and live their lives through their faith. They may, may be making rules where, you know, uh, you know, Jews 
can't take off for certain holidays or wear a kippah or whatever. So this is something of tremendous concern. I want to end with a hopeful note, though, and say that um, a, a couple of months ago, I was invited to the Pennsylvania Council of Churches to talk about this very topic that I'm talking about with you. And um, when I got to uh, Pennsylvania, I was in Harrisburg, it turned out that I was like one of the few non-pastors at this event. Uh, so here I am, you know, the only woman, the only Jewish person um, in a room full of pastors. And it was very interesting because two things were really being talked about there. One is, you know, Christian nationalism and what the, the impact it's had on churches um, uh, around the country. And the evangelical movement is talking about this as well. And also uh, what was really interesting is that the event was attended by both white pastors and black pastors. And they started talking about racism within the church. And it became a very interesting conversation. There were a couple of moments where I was like, wait a minute, why am I here? But actually joined in, uh, you know, just to have a discussion about, you know, racism, its impact, about nationalism and white nationalism, Christian nationalism and its impact. So my point really is to say that a lot of this is being discussed, not just by the Jewish community, but by the Christian community. And I think that's good. And that's a positive sign. I'm gonna end there. and. Um, I think we'll um, be open for, for questions. So thank you so much. Thank you, Marilyn. Really appreciate you giving that presentation and going into these details. I know I definitely learned a lot. I hope everybody else did. And I know we have some questions coming in. So um, before I jump into questions, I'm gonna introduce myself. My name is Jake Gardner. I am the chair of the Committee on Law Enforcement Extremism and Antisemitism. Um, and I am going to try and get through as many of these questions as I can in the time that we have left. So I'm just going to go ahead and start with the question. Um, why do you think all of these ideologies resonate with so many Americans? And what can we do to fight that? Well, I, I think um, I talked about that a little bit in my presentation. We, you know, the country number one is under, you know, has undergone in the last decades a number of political, social, cultural changes that can be scary for people, that there are demographic changes, there are changes in terms of, you know, cultural changes, more acceptance of um, non-traditional communities. Um, and then if you also tie in with all of that, what we've all gone through in the last few years with COVID, you know, with the pandemic, with political upheaval, um, the polarization in the country. And there's a tremendous, I mean, the tremendous polarization in the country where people who don't agree with you become your enemies. I think all of that has contributed to the current state that we're, we're in. And also I think there is a genuine desire for people to have some kind of, um, you know, stability, but also the people see that stability in different ways. For some people, that means going back to their vision of a traditional America. And they see that as, uh, you know, a country that where, you know, that was a Christian country where people went to church, where, you know, men and women, you know, got married and had traditional roles. And there was no such thing as someone changing their, you know, their gender. I mean, th these are all things that are affecting how people view the world. And when there is uncertainty in the world, you get people looking for answers and trying to understand uh, how they, they themselves can, um, you know, impact what they're seeing and, you know, in, in terms of how they view the world. Again, I think the way we deal with this, when it becomes, you know, used in a way to shut out other uh, groupings like the Jewish community, the Muslim community, or other or, or the gay and lesbian or the LGBTQ community is that we need to have allies and we need to work with all different groups. It's not just one group that's going to affect change, but you know, the Jewish community needs to align itself with other religious groups, um, for example, to stop the extremism within this community. And, and I think there's a desire for that. You know, I think certainly from what I saw when I went to that event and 
other things that I've seen. So it's really working, it's education, it's the community, you know, communities working together, um, trying to, uh, you know, have understanding and, and you know, tolerance and things like that. And I think that's how you make a difference. Jake, I can't hear you. I don't know. Oops. There, there Thank you. Thank you for that answer. Um, moving on to the next question. Where does Ron DeSantis' anti-woke agenda fit into all of this? Um, well, I would, you know, I would say that um, the, I'll, I'll, I'll just use the term woke. Uh, you know, the, it's not just Ron DeSantis using the, you know, woke and anti-woke. The term woke has been now, um, used by the right to talk about um, people who in the progressive world who um, may wanna confront issues such as sexism, racism, um, you know, other issues. And when people try to like address that through different programs, um, you know, or bring up um, issues around gender or race, um, the the right says that they're woke. And so what what DeSantis has done in Florida is he has, you know, created um uh you know his campaign revolved around uh an anti-woke agenda. And some of that included, now you may have heard that it's called the don't say gay bill. It it's not really called the don't say gay bill, but it stops um you know, uh, any teaching about gender issues um, for children under a certain age. And I think I read after he won that he's going to increase this. I think it was like third grade and below, and now he's going to make it, you know, a wider range. What that really translates into, and also there's, they're not just DeSantis, but again, all across the country, there are different communities passing laws against teaching about racism, about slavery, for them, that's being anti-American. It's being, um, you know, and you know, and so there's this this idea that um, that these these issues, if they're talked about, they're anti-American. And um, we we're seeing this being acted out in all sorts of ways. I had talked about a little bit before school boards, <laughs> parents coming to school boards demanding that books about even about the Holocaust be banned. Um, books about any that mention gender or sexuality at all be banned. This is dangerous in our country when you start talking about banning books because they're about ideas, ideas that you don't like. So um, I think, you know, DeSantis has certainly, he attracted, he, he, he did win the election by a large margin. He's attracted a lot of people. And in fact, I think he attracted maybe some people that traditionally were not um, people who voted Republican because they like his um, agenda for different reasons. Um, and there are people, and listen, the far left, There, I've talked about the far right today, there are issues with the far left also. And I wanna be clear about that. And this idea that, um, you know, there's, um, there's a lot of issues around demanding that people I'm going to say this in a general kind of way, think a certain way. And if they don't, then that means they are whatever, racist. That means they're sexist. That means they're the, we're, we're in, this is where we are in our society right now that people can't really talk through things, but instead accuse one or the other of being extreme in some way. So uh, based on their views, and this is, this is where we are right now. All right, um, on to the next question. And it kind of ties into a little bit about what you just said, but kind of instead of looking at the anti-woke agenda, um, like Mastriano's wife said something about how she loves Israel more than the Jews. And Trump has said that American Jews don't love Israel enough. Um, how does this language of love Israel more, or we love Israel more kind of fit into this Christian nationalist movement? Yeah, um, that is a, a very, um, I think, good question because uh, I think it certainly, um, when when 
when Trump made a statement about, you know, uh, you know, about how American Jews should be supporting him the way, you know, Jews in Israel do. And when Mastriano's wife said what she said, there's this certain idea being put forth that uh, people who are not Jewish uh, somehow um, not only basically are, are, you know, more, more like pro-Israel or pro-Jewish in some way than Jews themselves is, is quite, is kind of, um, you know, uh, I, I think um, an offensive idea, you know, to, to, to say that to the Jewish community. Um, and I think that um, it's played into Christian nationalism because this, this idea that, um, you know, I think, okay, the, the evangelical movement, as I'm sure many of you know, is very pro-Israel. It, it, very, it very much is. There's, there's tremendous financial support for Israel, tremendous political support for Israel. Um, what's been brought up as, as, you know, within that support is what is the support based on? Again, I am not an expert on religion, on Christianity, but there is this idea that one day all Jews will be converted and in order for that to happen in the biblical prophecy, all Jews have to be in Israel. It's just part of the biblical prophecy. So that's part of the support. But this idea that somehow, uh, you know, the Christian community can tell Jews uh, how they should, you know, either deal with Israel or deal with being Jewish is, is just, um, I think, um, you know, ludicrous. I mean, you know, it, the Jewish community uh, is first of all not monolithic. Uh, there are lots of different views within the community, as we all know. Um, there, you know, that old saying: "There are twenty Jews, twenty opinions." But I think that um, that ties into this idea that, again, you know, of uh, the domination of um, you know this idea that this is a Christian nation and that somehow um, that you know that these folks who are promoting this idea that they know better than just like somehow that actually is not a very welcoming, um, I would say, you know, statement to, for acceptance of the, you know, diverse Jewish community. Uh, uh, again, Jake, can't hear you. Thank you. So I'm just uh, in the interest of time, I think I'm gonna, that we had plenty of great questions that came in the chat. So thank you everybody for submitting them. I'm just gonna pick a couple more um, that we can go through really quickly. Um, so one of the question that also came in is um, the original America First movement was like led in the 1930s by Charles Lindbergh. And it was really started as isolationist in character, but it grew increasingly anti-Semitic. Does the current America First movement kind of make reference to or was born out of that original movement? Or how have we seen it morph over time? Um, you know, I, I remember uh, when that term America First was used uh, back um, you know, during the, the Trump campaign, um, I know that um, many of us felt really uncomfortable about it because of the association with the America First movement, but this is a different movement. There are some elements that are similar. Um, for example, um, the idea of isolationism is very much a part of the America First movement. They don't want America to be involved, for example, in Ukraine. They don't want America to be involved in foreign wars at all. That is similar to the America First movement of the um, 30s. In terms of the anti-Semitism, though, I think I mean there may there 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 are anti-Semitic elements within the America First grouping today, but it's not that explicit way that it was back in the 30s. Not it isn't. And in fact, there are many people um, on you know who believe in America First who are for example, supporters of that movement who are Jewish. And I think that, um, you know, that that is, and they don't, you know, they don't see this uh, movement as anti-Semitic. They feel like there's a place for them. There isn't that explicit anti-Semitism, although there may be, as I said, individuals who have anti-Semitic views. And as I mentioned, there are white supremacists who try to exploit the America First movement. So Nick Fuentes, the young man I mentioned, who is an anti-Semite and is a white supremacist, he calls his, uh, he has a foundation, a, a nonprofit he created 
both have the term America First. I think it's America First Foundation. I'd have to check that, but his conferences are called the America First Political Action Conference. I mean, they're just making, again, exploiting the term. So we'll see how much it pans out. All right. And then for our last question, how do you recommend talking to the younger generations about the increased presence and messaging of these extremist groups? Yeah, that's a really good question. I, you know, I get this question a lot at different events. And one of the things that I think is so critically important is to teach children critical thinking skills. The reason I say that is because we're seeing on social media and particularly on social media that a lot of um, you know, young white supremacists, for example, are very savvy in how they recruit young people and how they appeal to them. Like, for example, one of the things we see is like really bigoted humor that young people find funny and it's a way to attract young people to the movement, like with memes, like funny memes that are also filled with like bigotry. So I think that parents, um, first of all, should you know talk to their children. Again, I'm not an expert on education, but you need to know what your children are viewing online and you need to be able to talk to them about different things they may encounter because a lot of these, for example, we know that white supremacists try to recruit on gaming sites as, as an example. And child, you know, young people need to be prepared for what, you know, for being confronted with certain ideas and have critical thinking skills in order to be able to respond in a way that they're not pulled in, right? But they question what they're being told. And I, I think that's like the main thing is to, um, you know, be open with, with your, you know, with young people, talk to them about what they might encounter and teach them to understand that they need to look beyond some of the, you know, funny memes and other things and know that what's actually being said uh, is, you know, extreme or bigoted or anti-Semitic or racist, et cetera, et cetera. Well, thank you so much for uh, answering all of those questions. I know we had more. I wish we had time to go through all of them, but um, we'd just like to thank you again for taking the time to go through, give us such great information. Um, we were really lucky to have such amazing resources in the center and extremism, and we are really grateful for you to take the time to uh, help us set up this presentation and then record it with us. So. Um, well I want to thank thank all of you as well, um, uh, everyone in the um, in the Houston office, and and I'm really um, glad that I had the opportunity to to talk to all of you today. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Marilyn, Jake, Rebecca, Don, and all of you who joined us today. This concludes our program for today, and have a very happy and safe holiday season. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.